So welcome to my workbench where over the next three evenings, hopefully, we're going to be building one of these things, which is the Association Taster Kit, which you can buy from the Association's website, or if we ever get back to having real life exhibitions, you can buy it from the exhibition stand. So there's two components to this. Um, I've not glued this one together. There's a body, and I don't really want to say too much about the body today. We might come on to that later, but it's basically two sides, two ends, and a bottom. But we've also got um, the chassis, which ideally needs to be soldered together, and that seems to be the thing which causes most people most dread. So we'll spend most time on the chassis, and we can take some of the fear out of doing that. Now, I've mentioned soldering, so before we get really into it, I'm going to talk to you just for a couple of minutes about the equipment that I use. So yeah, this is, this is my soldering iron. It's an Antex. This one's plugged into a temperature controlled soldering station, but that's far more fancy than you need for building a simple wagon chassis kit. If you notice, I've got quite a small bit on here. It's a, a one millimeter chisel bit. It's not the smallest that you can get. But the idea is that heat flows through the bit. The more heat you want to get in, the bigger the bit you need. It's like having a, a wide water pipe rather than a small water pipe for heat to flow through. And um, the wattage of the iron really is secondary to that. My station is 50 watts, but that's basically how fast the iron can put heat through the channel of the size of the bit. So for most two mil work, you don't need anything more than an 18 watt iron. If you want to get more heat in faster, use a bigger bit, and then what you get is faster heat transfer. Where the wattage comes into play is if you want to replenish that heat at the bit as you're going along. The solder that I'm using is just this stuff. It's ordinary electrical solder, 6040 tin lead. I do much prefer the stuff with lead in it um, because it, it just flows better and you don't have to get it as hot. And I use this kind of flux, this is power flow flux, it's plumber's flux. It's quite strong, acidic, and if you don't clean it off carefully at the end of your modeling session, it will turn your nickel silver etches green. As with everything, I know there are different people use different tools and techniques. I'll say from the very beginning, this is just the way that I found that works for me. Um, it is not by any means the only way that you can do things. And I'd encourage anyone to have a go, experiment, try different things out and find out what works for you because you can struggle and struggle doing it the same way that someone's shown you. Try a different way and suddenly it becomes very, very easy. Um, I soon found out when I joined the association actually that um, if you asked six two mil modelers what's the best way of doing a particular job you'll get at least seven different answers so don't take this as you must follow these as instructions it's just my own particular serving suggestions anyway so i'll talk about the soldering iron the solder flux you definitely need flux and when i got this soldering station it came with a nice stand like this and it's got one of these sponges in and i grew up using one of these you put water on it and wipe your soldering iron tip on it to clean it and it worked, but I discovered something that works a lot better, which is one of these, and I'd recommend these to anybody. This is a sort of brass wool scoury thing. Well, it's a brass scour in an ashtray, but it says tip cleaner on the side, so it must be one. And rather than putting your bit on the damp sponge, which draws the heat away from it and introduces thermal shock, with this, you stab it into the scourer, and that polishes the bit, and it becomes really nice and shiny. Cleanliness is really important. You don't get good solder joints if things aren't clean. So important, stab this, don't wipe it. If you wipe it, all you're going to do is the brass scourer will flick bits of solder all over the place, um, possibly even into your eyes. And speaking of flicking bits of solder into your eyes, I should give the, uh, the old health and safety. You're going to see things on my bench which are hot and can burn you, sharp and can cut you, um, poisonous and can make you ill. Um, nasty fumes, nasty chemicals, obviously lead solder is quite toxic. So, you know, make sure that if you get any tools or equipment, follow the manufacturer's instructions and wear any personal protective equipment as you see fit. The idea is that you will be able to copy what I'm doing, um, do it for yourself, but I wouldn't want anyone to get injured in the process. 
This is one half of the kit as you get it. The other bit is the body, which comes on a sprue. I said I didn't want to talk too much about the body to begin with, and I don't. But what I will say is that these things actually are made as part of a twin pack. If you join the association, um, you can buy these as a twin pack, and they come on sprues where there's one side of a wagon with a top flap door, one side without. Um, these are chopped up, and hopefully in your introductory pack, you get two of one or two of the other. So you may have a top flap door, you may have one without. For the purposes of this, it doesn't matter. But there are other kits in this range which have different features, and this chassis can go under several different wagon kits, or different mineral wagon kits. Some of them have buffer beams. And this one has a buffer beam as part of the wagon end. And so when you come to build the chassis, you may wish to remove the buffer beams that are on here because there are separate parts to put on if your kit doesn't have a buffer beam. And I have one here, which is the riveted body mineral wagon. The plastic body for this, you can see, doesn't have a buffer beam. So you need to know which body you're building this for. And similarly, you'll see that it can be built with two or four shoe Morton brakes. So there's an edge here that folds up with two sets of brakes, making it four shoe. The one I'm going to build is the simplest kind of wagon of all, like this one that I've already made. It's got brakes on one side only with the handle with a Morton clutch and a cross shaft underneath. So this is what we're aiming for. Hopefully by Thursday night we'll be there. So cleaning. Um, you can, if you want, use a fiberglass scratch brush to clean your etches. I definitely would have avoid that. Um, here's the kind of thing that you get. This one's like a propelling pencil. It's got the scratch bristles inside. Um, you have to use these for some things but I really hate them. I use them as little as possible because I always get bits in my fingers. So for cleaning big flat things, I use um, something like this, which is probably too big to fit under the camera. This is a Gary Flex abrasive block. If you think of an outsized Pico track rubber, that's kind of what it is. And you can just gently rub this over the edge and it gives it a nice mechanical clean, just the same as if you did it with a fiberglass brush only without getting things in your fingers. And the reason I'm doing it on this bit of hardboard rather than on my bench is that when I've finished, I can take the hardboard away and brush it off into the bin. And then um, it's clean and I've not got bits all over my bench. So I just cleaned a little bit of that, but to save time, I've got one here that I cleaned earlier, get the right one. So this one is ready to go. And the reason you need to clean these etches is because as they come from the um, etchers, they're covered in bits of chemical residue. They might be tarnished if they've been in stock for a long time. So the next thing to do is to remove the parts and start cutting, cutting things out. And to do that, I'm going to still do this on this bit of hardboard. You need a hard surface because these etches are very thin, they're flexible. If I did it straight onto my cutting mat, I would bend the etches. In fact, hardboard sometimes isn't really hard enough. If you've got a 10 thou etch like this is with a 5 thou tab, that's okay. And to do the cutting, I'm going to use an ordinary scalpel. This is a Swan Morton scalpel, and it's got a retractable blade, which I find really handy, so that when I drop it, it doesn't stab into my leg. And also, it's a nice weighty handle. I, I find I like that. So it's a case of finding the part we want. We're going to start off with the main wagon chassis and work your way around cutting through the tabs and you can hear a nice satisfying clunk or crunch as you go through the tabs. Now with this one I put a new blade in just before we came online because I always start a new kit with a new blade. You've got to watch your fingers with this and push down with the blade, don't push sideways. If you put pressure sideways on these things, they flex a bit and then they snap and the end pings up and hits you in the face. So uh, technically you should probably be wearing safety glasses to use one of these. And there are a lot of tabs to cut through on this. You just got to work your way around. Usually I end up missing one. Um, and I have missed one, it's that one there. 
okay and then that lifts off and we're left with this main piece of the etch which is the fold-up chassis now from this point I want to remove the bits of this that I'm not going to make so those buffer beams I don't need and there's a little tag to cut through there and I can cut through the metal here if I want to it's quite chunky or alternatively I could get some pliers it's always good to have a pair of pliers handy grab hold of this end and just bend it backwards and forwards a couple of times it's useful to try doing this actually because I reckon you can get one fold one unfold and one fold again with these etches if you make a mistake before the etch actually falls to bits on you um, which obviously you don't want to do so I'm going to cut that off and do the same on this side you will notice that there's a little slot along here and on the etches there is a sort of inner secondary buffer beam um, there's one here in this corner which is going to go into that slot and reinforce this but we don't put that on quite yet we'll do that later the other things i want to remove are these tie bars um, if you're a wagonologist you'll know that these tie bars were found on wagons that had four shoes and vacuum brakes with the increased force of vacuum brakes they pushed the wheels apart and so these tie bars were introduced so i'm just using some zuron scissors here i'll try and do this so you can see it cutting in as close as i can and what i'll need to do later on is go in and sort of file up any edges to make these flush so that's one side cut away so what we need to do next um, is to solder in some bearings and you will have received with your kit some of these things i've got rather a lot of them um, for my ambitious wagon building project i don't know how well you'll be able to see these things but these are top hat axle bearings and the idea is that they go into these little holes here and you can see that the hole has got a half etched recess around it the bearing needs to go into the hole with the rim of the top hat just sitting in the half etch and this is going to form the inside or the underneath and inside of the wagon chassis you can see these half etch lines here these are fold lines generally on two mil kits where you get half etching fold lines and things that's the inside of the fold now as always there are many ways of doing this some people fold up the chassis first and put the bearings in after i prefer to put the bearings in first and do the folding up afterwards but before these bearings will fit into these holes i need to open them out a bit custom and practice with etched kits is to make holes slightly undersized because when you're etching things you're not in complete control of the chemical process so if the etch is overcooked slightly if your holes were drawn undersized they'll be the right size if the etch was not overcooked they'll be undersized so i'm going to use this tool this is a five-sided cutting brooch they come in little vinyl wallets of half a dozen different sizes and i'm just going to go into here and open this hole out i can tell from looking at this that it's slightly too small you can do this with a really small file as well but the cutting brooch is the tool for the job um, and this needs to be opened out to one millimeter diameter so that the axle bearing will fit in the hole and i know from my experience that that is one millimeter what you have to do is open it a bit test fit the bearing and if it doesn't fit open it a bit more so we'll just do this one for now and then I'm going to introduce you to the board that I'm going to use to solder on. Um, this is a piece of building material called Trespa. And you see it's got lots of holes in already, which I've drilled for various wagon chassis. But if you had a piece of hardboard, you could drill holes like this. And the idea is that the top hat bearings will poke down into these holes as I build the chassis. Um, so I'll just check before we get going that that one will fit. And it will, that's a perfect fit in there. And as you get more, these line up with the holes. One other thing I've just spotted actually is um, you'll see some blind holes. These little holes in the W irons or axle guards to give them their proper name, these were for putting ropes onto with a hook to, to draw the wagon along by a tractor or a horse or something. Some of them had holes in both sides. So there's a blind hole there. You can drill that out with a little drill if you're modeling a wagon that had two anyway to solder this in we need some flux and we need some solder so going back to my paste flux i use a cocktail stick and with the cocktail stick you can put on 
a controlled amount. Um, now I'm just going to put the end of my tweezers on that bearing to stop it flicking away. So this manky looking cocktail stick it's gone brown because it's rotting because it's been in the flux jar for a few weeks um, just put the flux on there wipe it round you don't need masses and masses of this but because it's a paste it's sticky and it'll go where you put it okay so my solder this is the end of my solder reel here we need a controlled amount of solder so um, I was shown this technique and I find it really useful put my finger on the end of the solder and then with my scalpel plate, just chop off a tiny little crumb, a bit like a salami slice. And with the end of the blade, I can pick that up and put it there next to the bearing, not on the bearing, it's just next to it. And the stickiness of the um, flux will hold that in place. A lot of my friends actually have stopped using chopped up bits of solder and started using solder balls, which are used in the electronics industry. And you can, you can buy those online. Um, but because I've got this massive reel of solder, which is probably going to last me my whole lifetime, um, I haven't bought any of those to try them. But that's another way of um, getting a tiny controlled amount of solder without having to chop your own pieces up. Okay, so holding this bearing down to make sure it's flat, the trespa underneath is supporting it all around. I've stabbed my iron a few times into my um, brass wool. I'm just going to bring it in next to the bearing and the heat's going to go in. And if I bring it round, um, eventually this solder will just liquefy. There it goes. I don't know if you saw that. And this way, the bearing gets soldered in without an excess of solder all around it. And the flux has drawn that solder down into the joint. Now, I had to hold the iron on a few seconds to get the heat in. Um, if you had a bigger tip on the iron, you wouldn't have had to hold it on for as long. But sometimes having that extra length of time and letting the heat build up is a good thing because it gives you more control and it stops you doing things like filling this tiny hole with a big blob of solder etc etc um, if we turn this over now and you might not be able to see this on camera but if this joint has worked properly what you should be able to see is round this side on the other side of it just the thinnest sliver of silver where the solder has gone through the joint and to the other side if it was a very tight fit in the hole you might not see that Okay, so having done that one, you then need to go round and do the other four. And in order to save time, I have actually prepared one of these where I've gone round and I've done all four. So after a bit of practice, this is where you'll get up to. Now, I just want to turn this back over and have a look at where these axle bearings protrude. And because of the way they're made, you quite often get a little turning pip on the end of them. And that's enough to stop everything fitting together properly. So while we remember, this is a good time to file those pips off. So I'm going to use a number four cut flat pillar needle file. It's quite fine. And just giving it a couple of strokes over the top. And you can feel when the pips are no longer there because as the pips are there, the file kind of makes a little crunching sound as it goes along and you feel some resistance. When the resistance has gone and the sound changes, you know that those pips have gone away and you've got a smooth surface. Next, I think what we need to do is to fold up this chassis. And to do that, you don't need anything special. You can't just fold it in your fingers because this is quite a long edge. So I happen to have uh, an engineer's square. This is a fairly small one which is a perfect width for folding things up. You need something with a hard square edge. You can do it over the jaws of the vise if you want. And from the back, or which is going to be the top side of this chassis, you can see the lines where the folds have got these relief holes in them. So I can line those up with the edge of this um, lump of metal and with something equally hard and firm, like a steel ruler, just push this on the edge and push the thing down. And what will happen is that will fold over nicely and it won't fold to 
exactly 90 degrees. If I try and angle this on the bench so you can see there, um, it's just a little less than 90 degrees. Because these things are springy, probably the best thing to do is just fold it with this slightly further than 90 degrees and then let it spring back or if need be push it back. But it's important that you get it to as close to 90 degrees as you can. Although having said that, these there is some spring in these, and they are a little bit forgiving. So I've done one side, need to do the other side. And at this point, if you want to, you can pop the wheels in and test that this thing rolls up and down. Um, just fold this one over again, and same drill, squash it just past 90 degrees and it'll spring back. And if you need to, you can get some slack nose pliers and just tweak this along wherever you need to. I'll switch back to my face and what I'm doing, I'm just holding it up and looking along it like this. Um, human eye is actually remarkably good at telling whether something is a right angle or not. Okay, so there we are, back to the bench. And what we need to do now is fold up the sole bars and sweat those over the top. So this is the inner layer of what will become several layers of etch that build up the three-dimensional detail. Back to my etch. And what we've got next are these sole bars, springs, and the beginnings of the axle boxes, which are all together. And you've got four. You've got an inner one and an outer one for each side. The outer one has got the half etch detail on it. And the inner and outer are actually joined together by these little tags. And rather than cut them out separately, it's convenient to use these tags as hinges to fold them up. So I'm going to go back to my hardboard and I'm going to cut out one of these. So I'll start here. And when it comes to cutting next to the half edge, rather than getting as close to the piece as I can, I'm going to cut away from it so it doesn't bend it and squash it into shape. Uh, that tag will need to get filed off later on. I'll cut here and I'll cut here and I'm bound to miss one. In fact, I think I've, yeah, there's one there. They're everywhere. Um, I think it was Bob Jones who designed these etches. And uh, he designed them not to fall apart. I have missed one. So you need to uh, sort of poke it around, see where it's missed. Oh, it's that one there. Go. And a couple of extra tags from where we moved the other part on the bottom of the axle boxes. Right, so this now needs to fold up and I'm not going to fold it, you fold this in your fingers on those two little hinges, um, where can we see it? it, folds like this and before I fold it all the way up we're going to sweat these things together. Now some people would say okay tin the inside of this before you sweat it. And you could do that. Um, in fact, I think I probably will. Um, the other way of doing it is to put flux in between and then introduce the solder from the sides. And I think I'll, I'll do some this way and some the other way just to show you the different methods. So let's get the flux. And you need to cover every part of this with flux, except the backs of the hinges and this thing sticking down, which is the back of the door bumper. And I'm putting this flux on the non-detailed side because that's going to be the inside. And this is um, where we're different from the usual run-of-the-mill things where the half etched tag, this side is on the outside of the fold because it's a 180 degree rather than a 90 degree fold. So once that's fluxed, I can come back and get my solder, chop off a couple more salami slices ready. And when I come to solder this, again, I'm gonna go back to my lump of Trespa to solder it on, rather than soldering it on the hardboard. Of course, I could easily solder it on the hardboard, but the reason I don't want to is because the hardboard will burn, and then you get a nasty residue from the hardboard on the outside face of this etch, which I'd then need to clean off afterwards, uh, which would be more work. So again, a couple of dabs with the soldering iron into the tip cleaner. And 
I'm going to hold this with my tweezers. So pick up the crumb solder on the iron this time rather than putting it in place. And then we can just move it around and cover everywhere with solder. And if there's places where the solder does not want to stick as you move the iron over it on this etch, then that tells you that the metal wasn't clean or you haven't got any flux there. And to a certain extent, the flux will mitigate having something that's slightly unclean um, because as it heats up, the, so it has this corrosive effect, um, which is both why it's good and why it's bad. Because if you don't wash it all off properly, it corrodes in the box and under the paint. Okay, so that's done, that's tinned, and we can then go ahead and fold this up. I'm just going to leave it um, a few seconds before I touch it because it will be hot. But before I do fold it up, I want to put a bit more flux on here um, to make the sandwich. So a bit of flux on the inside and then fold it over. And when it's folded over, it won't automatically be in line. Um, probably not easy to see but this isn't quite in registration and if you want your wagon chassis to sit underneath the body properly you need to get this in exact registration. So what I'm going to do is with my tweezers just squeeze the top and bottom and then push down over where the hinge was and make sure that they are in line and do the same at the other end. Um, squeeze with my tweezers to line them up and then push down with my nail over the hinge to get them in line. And once they're in line, the hinges will keep them in line. I'm going to turn this over and now I can see that's not quite in line there. Squeeze it again. Okay, so now I'm happy with that. I'm going to tin it again from the back. And the process of tinning this from the back is going to sweat the two layers together. I can't sweat these two layers together with a dry iron because I need solder on the iron tip for the heat to flow through it. Put some flux on, not a lot, um, don't need a lot, and get another piece of solder. So this is going to both tin the back and sweat the layers together. So I'll pick that up with the iron again and then go for it. And this time, I can dwell a little bit longer. So I'm going to get this solder everywhere. Okay. And make sure that the solder in between has properly melted. So that's now one solid piece. It's got these tags still. And these tags need to get cut off, um, the things that I called hinges earlier, um, because they would stop the body sitting down nicely. There's a nice little double click when you chop these off with your scalpel as it goes through the layers. Click, click. Oops, it's only done one layer. And then with a file, I'm now going to just file along the top. I don't know if it's possible to see but where these two pieces of metal have come together, you get like a little cusp, a couple of ridges along the top. And for this, I'm going to use not my nice number four cut file, but this file. This is a horrible, cheap Chinese file that came in a vinyl wallet of 10. Um, and I use it for cleaning anything that's covered in solder and is a bit manky. So I'm just going to rub this along the top to clean it off. And again, I'm listening for the sound it's making. When it becomes smooth, I can feel that it's smooth. I don't need to inspect it. I'm filing along it rather than across it for this. And then you can see it's nice and nice and shiny along the top now and smooth. What I want to do is solder this one onto the chassis. And the axle bearings are sticking up and they're going to stick through the holes here and help me get everything aligned. I'm going to put it on my bench. And this flat trestba is going to act as the flat way of aligning it at the top. And if I push this down, I know it's aligned. 
when it comes to aligning it horizontally, the holes um, that are in this etch are slightly larger than the axle bearings, so it does move around up and down a little bit. Depending on the chassis, if you've got um, holes for brake rods in the overlays and in the chassis, you can put a piece of wire through and line them up. This one hasn't, so I'm going to have to align this up by eye in the sort of horizontal direction. But before I can do that, I just need to tin this side here. So again, very quickly, another piece of solder, another bit of flux, and this time I'm going to tin this just along the top of the sole bar. I'm not going to bother trying to tin round where the axle bearings are, because if I did that, I'd probably end up unsoldering them. But because this is nickel silver, it doesn't draw the heat as much as brass does. I can hold this in my fingers without burning myself. Um, you could hold it in pliers if you didn't trust yourself and just put the solder on. I'm just going to go along this top edge like this, being careful not to fill up the holes. Okay, and that's getting hot enough for me now. So that's tinned, and again, a bit more flux on top of there, and I can line this up now and put it in place. Now, to solder this on, I'm going to do some tack soldering from the bottom, and then seam solder it from the top. So I'm going to cut myself a number of little pieces. Three, um, four, five, six of various thicknesses. And then in my tweezers, I'm going to hold this at one end. And I'm just going to check with my eyes that this is lined up centrally, which I think it is. And then as this is held and clamped in my tweezers, get another pair of tweezers, which are lurking on the bench, and just make sure that's pushed down flat. And that goes on the way it needs to go on. And then I'm going to solder just here at this end. So clean the iron, pick up a crumb of solder and just put it on there. And because I've got the flux in between these layers, that's just going to carry the solder down into the gap. And then I can pick it up and just check that it's smooth and level at the top. It's where it needs to be. Um, and that one isn't quite. Um, somehow it's not gone in quite the right place. But that's okay because I've just checked it. I can remelt this solder and push down and adjust its position. Check again. And that's more like it. And then I can do the other side, tack that into place, making sure that everything is lined up the way it needs to be. And again, another little piece of solder and push that on there. Okay. Check that this one's lined up nicely at the top. Actually, I'm still not convinced that this end is tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to hold it in the tweezers like this and melt it again. Put my iron in from behind. Um, there, I heard it click. Sometimes it's better if things go wrong, but the, point, the important thing is that you keep checking at every stage um, that you're happy with how things are rather than moving on if they're not quite right. Okay, um, so I'm going to do the same thing in the middle tack it from underneath and then when I put the soldering iron in from on top with solder in it's going to draw this solder from the bottom here up through and melt the solder that's already there. Get that lump in there. So that's packed in place at the bottom. And I can turn this over this top seam Put some flux along it. Again, holding this now in the, the length of the tweezers like a clamp. Get my solder and dwell now with the iron so that this all heats up and the solder flows down into that joint. And we need another one. And you can see 
when the joint is made because the solder just disappears. I need one more crumb for this end. In fact, this end's just slightly springing apart a bit because I wasn't supporting it. So I'll put the tweezers at that end. Of course, these tweezers are acting as a little bit of a heat sink, which is why I need to dwell more. So um, having the small bit helps in that it takes longer to heat up and I can make sure everything's okay. But if I wanted to work faster, a bigger bit would do. Okay, so I've got that one side on and I think um, given the time, that's as far as I want to go this evening. What I'd then do is go and do exactly the same for the other side. In fact, I've got one ready, which has got the sole bar soldered in on the other side. And with this particular one, we shall pick up again tomorrow evening um, with the axle boxes and solder the next layers of those on. Mm -hmm.